Vibrations Podcast, Part 22, Martin Ludlow. Hi, I'm Gary Brightman, and this is my weekly podcast called Vibrations. Established in 2018, Vibe is a book and music shop situated in Moi Wo on Lantau Island in Hong Kong. Our current top-selling books are The Flower Boat Girl by Larry Fane and The Snakes of Hong Kong Field Guide by Adam Francis. And I don't see this changing any time soon. Since its global premiere at Vibe, The Flower Boat Girl continues to sell well. I'm thoroughly enjoying reading this book, based on a true story that has never been told until now. It's the tale of 26-year-old Yang Shek, who, against all odds, shaped history in the South China Seas as a pirate on her own terms. We'll be talking to Larry about his new book in an upcoming podcast. In two weeks, we've shifted 60 copies of the Snakes of Hong Kong guides and sold out three times. We're due to get the next stock in sometime next week. So reserve your copy now to avoid disappointment. In our Vibe version 2 reboot, we continue to give away free books of every genre. This successful new initiative is making room for new stock to tempt you with. In Hong Kong in general, increasingly more people are being vaccinated with either Sinovac or BioNTech vaccines, including me and the other Vibe staff. Hopefully in a few months' time, the majority of Hong Kong residents will be vaccinated and we can start to get on with our lives. This Saturday, the 17th of April, at 2pm, we have local photographer and the subject of our last podcast, Patrick Dransfield at Vibe, doing a presentation and signing books. As usual, this presentation will be broadcast live on Facebook at the Vibe Silver Mine Bay page and available thereafter on YouTube at live at Vibe HK. Oh, nearly forgot. Last week we welcomed the cameras and production team of View TV at Vibe for a shoot as part of their documentary on Hong Kong's number one canto pop band, Mirror. I've been asked not to publish any pictures from this shoot until after their doco is released in June. But if you come to Vibe, I'll show you my signed copy of their latest CD. As rare as rocking horse doo-doos in Hong Kong, apparently. Hopefully, both myself and Vibe will appear in the resulting Mirror documentary. Future stardom awaits. And so, to this week's interview with local author and businessman Martin Ludlow. His recently published book, Porridge and Honey, is available now at Vibe, and we hope to have Martin in for our next Facebook Live presentation. Martin was born in South Wales in 1959 and joined the financial services industry in 1984. He enjoyed a career in both management and as a financial advisor. Martin specialises in providing bespoke financial advice to higher net worth clients. His clients live throughout Asia, the UK, Europe and the Middle East. Martin now lives in Hong Kong, representing St James Place Wealth Management. An avid student of personal development, Martin has spoken all over the world, including Chicago, Hong Kong, Zimbabwe, Vienna, Salzburg and Monte Carlo. In his spare time, he enjoys performing stand-up comedy for charity and is now a published author, with his second book well on its way. OK, welcome to Vibe, Martin. Thank you, Gary. OK, so as we do, we're going to go into um, nine quick-fire questions. And the first question is, what's your favourite book or author? Oh, that one. I think it's going to be um, Harari Sapiens. Okay. That's uh, it's modern thinking. Uh, right. Great science behind the book, and I just love it. He's a great author, and I'm looking forward to the next book, which is uh, okay. Homo Deus. But it really goes into the history of mankind in a brilliant way. What is your favourite musical artist? That's easy. Um, I think number one would have to be Bowie. Yeah, that guy reinvented himself yes. so many times. Yeah. He was contemporary, and he wrote music up until a few days before he died, and it was good yeah. music. He's inspired so many other people, like Iggy Pop and Motley yep. Crue and others. And I just think he's a genius. Okay, um, preferred drink: red wine. Red wine. Red wine. Full-bodied yep. red wine. Nice, nice. From I don't mind New Age. Or the real stuff, you know, going yeah. back to France. But, uh, yeah, I'm a sucker for red wine. Do you have a life motto? There's a couple, but um, I think my favourite's probably going to be uh, 
be yourself. Everybody else is taken. What is your favourite Hong Kong restaurant? That's a tough one. Just before the protests, um, I was at a quiz night one night and somebody, the question was, Hong Kong has 28,000 of what two things? One was trash cans and the other was restaurants, bars. Really? I know it's reduced a bit now in the last couple of years, but uh, most, a lot of them are Michelin star restaurants. So it's very difficult to choose a best one. But look, I, I didn't fight my way to the top of the food chain to be vegetarian, so it's got to be steak. <laughs> yes. So I think in the old days it was certainly Shaw Bar. Okay. And uh, almost anything Mark Chuleka touches is brilliant. Uh, now I would probably go for one of the big meat boys like Gaucho, yeah. Lowry's, something like that. Yeah, Chris, very good, Gaucho's. Just, just love a nice steak. Yeah. But not every day. Here's, here's an uh, off-the-wall question. Faced with a python whilst walking up to the peak, what would you do? Well, snakes has always been one of my phobias. And yeah. When I come to Hong Kong, and where, where we are in Lantau, it is a tropical island. Yeah. So there are many snakes here. I yes. mean, I've only seen three small ones, but we've seen lots of people posting four or five meter pythons on my doorstep, really, yes. really close. So I joined the group uh, Hong Kong Snakes because I was frightened. And now I've learned more, I'm less frightened. But to answer your question, if I saw a big python, yeah. I would reverse slowly. That would probably be the day I discover adrenaline is brown. And then <laughs> I would run like hell. <coughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Best advice you were given? Uh, when I was 17 in uh, Merthyr Tidville College of Knowledge, studying to be a chef, yeah. I was very lucky. Um, the head of the department, Tom Campbell, took me under his wing. And he helped me a lot. And uh, I, my father left when I was five, so he was like a father figure to me right. later in life. And uh, Tom always used to say, work hard, stay humble. Yeah, good. And I think that's the best advice he gave me. Yeah. And, and I hope I took it. Finish this sentence, I live in Hong Kong because... I can do that with two words. Because I can. Yeah. I chose to be here. I wanted to be here. I want to retire here. And uh, I just love the whole thing about where we are. Me too. Despite the turbulence, you know, it's still a great place. Yes. Uh, yes. With a great future. Yes. And, uh, you know, this is my home. I'll, I'll, I'll qualify it a little better. I went back to the UK just over a year ago at Christmas... And somebody asked me that question. Yeah. And my younger son, Jack, launched in, he, he became the ambassador of tourism for Hong Kong when he said, mm -hmm. he said, my dad lives five minutes from the beach. He lives yeah. five minutes from the jungle. There's beautiful beaches to the left of the silver mine, like yeah. tropical beaches. We have the waterfalls, yeah. fantastic bars and restaurants where everybody knows each other of all ethnic div you know, diversity. Yeah. And I looked at him and my jaw dropped and I said, Wow, you're right. Yeah, it is like that. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, so it's none of it's been lost on him. Sure. And maybe at some point you think he would want to come over here and live here. Uh, I don't think he would live here. I yeah. Mean, my son is an international gypsy. Okay. He was yeah. living in Norway for a few years. He's now in Dubai. Yeah. So I don't think he'd live here, but I do know he loves the place. He has his own friends here. He yeah. knows the place well. So when he shows up, all he asks for is a key and an octopus card, <laughs> and he can do his own thing. So. Brilliant. But he, I mean, he hasn't been able to travel lately because of COVID. Yeah. But uh, Jack, if they lifted the restrictions, he'd be out straight away. And, oh, right. and Daniel, my eldest son, they would be here straight away. How old are your sons? Uh, you got me. Uh, <laughs> Daniel was born in 1988. Okay. And Jack, 91. All right. Finally, the last question is um, your favourite area of Hong Kong? Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. mean the bookshop. No. Oh, it's a shame. As much as I like it. But, <laughs> but Lantau does have everything, you know, yeah. to jump on the back of what Jack said. Where we are, um, we don't leave your weekends. Everybody yeah. comes to us. Yes. And it gets a bit crowded. But we just got the road and you've got great tourist attractions like the Big Buddha and yeah. all the little beaches on the way up the coast. Yeah. And uh, just over a year ago, my nephew visited from the States with his lovely fiance, And we got a cab down, yeah. coming down the coast. And she was shocked. And she said, this is not what I expected of Hong Kong. Where's all the big buildings? I said, oh, yeah. they're across the ocean. And uh, she just loved this whole area. She said, yeah. this, this is more like Cambodia, Vietnam, places like that than it is. Yeah. Because we, we walked home one night and she saw the buffaloes to walk home past buffaloes. Oh, yeah. They live in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. It was very exotic for them. Mr. Fong was out with the big tortoises. Uh, oh, yes. And uh, I often race them. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I win. 
they, I, I pay them first. Just so the, the, the listeners know, so Mr. Fong has two giant tortoises. I think they're about 40 years old or something. No idea. Can't remember, but anyway, he takes them out for walks. They're probably uh, two or three foot off the ground, aren't sure. they? They're pretty big uh, yeah. guys. Well, the kids could ride them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, we've got Spider-Man riding around here on his bike, playing terrible music. Yeah, our own superhero. And yep. it's, it's such a quirky place. I've never been to a place like it, and I've been yeah. lucky enough to travel the world. I've seen every continent, and, uh, you know, I've just never lived in a place like this. Let's go back a bit to your uh, sort of childhood where you grew up. Mirtha Tidville, um, back in the late 50s, early 1960s, um, that was your your upbringing, I think, wasn't sure. it? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we had um, quite a humble upbringing. I, I grew up on a council estate. Yeah. Um, single parent family. I was the eldest. But it was, I, I had a very happy childhood growing up. We yeah. we didn't have, well, we had everything except money. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we were, in my mind, we were quite rich. Yeah, yeah. Other people just had the money, you know. But it, yeah. was, it was great and we all helped each other. There was no unemployment. It was yeah. a great time, and it was it was great. It was very family orientated, so I yeah. spent a lot of time with my grandparents. As I state in the book, in for the, the dedication is to my grandparents. Yes, and I, I was very lucky to um, to be part of that. And I mean, Merthyr, I mean, let's get it. Let's be honest. It is a rough town, or was a rough town, and there were right. some tough guys there. So it certainly taught me rules and values. Yeah, yeah. And to some some of the most decent people in the world yeah. were there. Uh, one lovely memory was when I was about 18, I had this clapped out motorbike. All my friends had Suzuki's and whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, I had yeah. this old Czechoslovakian bike called CZ. Okay, yeah, my yeah. My mates would call it C's Up. <laughs> but on the weekends, I'd like to go down the Merthyr Labour Club with my grandfather to listen to the guy's stories. Yeah. They didn't have TVs, but they had the wireless okay. the radio. And, and they embellished the stories very well, but the Merthyr Labour Club... There was no class distinction there. You'd have lawyers, priests, accountants, bin men, really? all of life. And it was to be in the lounge listening to those guys yeah. shaped a lot of my thinking. Really? And the banter was amazing. And my grandfather was very integral, integral in there. He was very outspoken. Um, everybody <laughs> said, how, 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 he's never had a broken nose. We just don't know. <laughs> but he, you know, Willie was a great guy and popular and yeah. spoke his mind. But now growing up in Merthyr was, was, was great for me. But my grandfather yeah. would come home from work in the mid-60s, give my grandmother his pay packet. Yeah. She'd give him 30 bob back, one pound right. fifty. That had to last him for the week, and he wouldn't dare ask her for more money. Yeah. But they didn't have a bank account. Never had a bank account. My mother didn't have a bank account until she was about 62. So you, it was, everything was cash. Yeah. If we couldn't afford it. We didn't have it. Okay, so you're, you're, you're in Merthyr up until you're sort of late teens when, when did you leave Merthyr I left young very young um, yeah I went into catering and I went into management very young okay and I worked for Grand Met which was a yeah I know a good father to me and Grand Met um, taught me a lot I started going on really good courses I was beginning to do well in college because I wasn't particularly academic leaving school but yeah my mother was very proud when I was student of the year in the college yeah and she'd get to meet the mayor and have drinks in his parlour uh -huh. And that was good. I mean, I was proud of that. And then uh, Grand Met put me on a region as a area manager from Big Triangle, from Bristol to Llanetli to Brecon. Okay. That was fantastic because I learned so much yeah. about different... We had industrial catering, we had schools, hospitals, yeah. um, you know, restaurants. It was just fantastic for me. And I learned so much very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I wasn't a chef for long. Right, I okay. Sort of, it went into management very young. Yeah, and then after that, I went into the money business. What age would have you you've been then? Twenty four. So. Oh, okay. So still quite young. So after the yeah, yeah the catering stuff. Yeah. Well, we had a we had a big recession, early eighties, late yes. seventies, and we were contract caterers, and we had some chunky contracts like the BBC, HTV, things like that. Nice. And uh, sorry, not BBC, but HTV. But um, everyone was cutting back. Yeah. And my last job was a great job. It was catering manager at the Western Mail and Echo, the local newspaper. Okay. So I've been part of the team that cooked for Margaret Thatcher, James Callahan. Really? The heroes of the day. We did an amazing buffet in Bridge End for Princess Anne. Wow. And she didn't eat. 
No. <laughs> Suckling pigs, everything. And Suckling I, pigs. I had a wonderful team there. The chefs did us proud. Did you ever get to meet these yeah, people? Oh, yeah. Really? Do, do you know what she wanted to do? Yeah. Rather than meet the management, because they can't carry cash, uh, she couldn't touch anything. Yeah. She couldn't eat the food there, despite Buckingham Palace sending the, the menus. She, she wasn't allowed to eat. And, uh, but Terrible. But she, she asked to meet the staff. Yeah. And one of her team gave them all an envelope. It wasn't a red one like we do here. Yeah, yeah. But all the waitresses got a tip. How good is that? From Princess Anne. That's brilliant. And I thought that was lovely. And she come. Yeah. She wasn't interested in me or the management, but she'd ask questions. What does that lady do? Where yeah. does she live? How long has she been here? Yeah. And I thought that was wonderful. So. And then one day, at the Western Mill and Echo, three yeah. o'clock, we would get the evening newspaper before anybody else. So my kitchen porter George brought up the newspaper, and I knew I was in line. We were either going to be downsized, yeah. which would fit my income, or made redundant. Yeah. And the uh, Western Mail were cutting the subsidy down from 24 hour service to mostly vending machines. They didn't need my chefs, my team, me. Could have done it with the clerk. So there's an advert for um, Crown Financial Management. And I thought, okay. I'm not going to give up my catering with these qualifications yeah. in the background. I went for an interview and I saw two guys I recognized from my catering days. Yeah. One worked at Avon Inflatables in Llanetli, yeah. and uh, and the other one worked in Swansea. and they were personnel managers now in the insurance business right. and they told me what they were earning and the convention they'd just been on Yeah. and I remember saying to the manager I want this job if they can do it I can and they're earning double where I am Yeah. self-employed as well Yeah. and uh, the training was good and then I grew again went into management very quickly building teams Yeah. and uh, then got into the corporate world my last big position was with Guardian okay. I had about 400 people working for me Guardian Royal Exchange. Guardian, Guardian Royal, Center. of course. So we covered an area from Preston down to Plymouth. So I had half the country. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I big loved half. It. I loved it because we had a great resource centre. Uh, the staff could learn. I'm very much into personal development. Yeah. And uh, and then in the in the mid-90s, uh, same story. They were downsizing all the yeah. direct sales forces, appointed representatives. And they were great days. We had amazing conventions. And we did a great job. I mean, I'm still in the business. And a lot of the people I see now, I've got these plans from way back then, and it's the only money they've got. Right. And a lot of them are things yeah. like bits and pieces of pensions all over the place, but they can't touch it. Yeah. So th those, those plans have done their purpose, and they were yeah. sold. And there's no yeah. queue outside my office of people saying, I want to come and buy this, I want to come and buy that. Yeah. They were sold. It's different these days with how you market yourself and events and things. But um, when that shut down, I thought, oh, I'm going to do it myself. Right. And I hope all mm -hmm. these things I'd be teaching these guys work because yeah. I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> yeah. And I did. And I did it. And I've still got a small business in the UK, which is looked ah. after by a couple of locums. But my main focus now is here. Yeah. What made you come to Hong Kong? Okay. Um, the headhunter called and said, can you go to Geneva tomorrow? And I said, sure, sure. And I just got divorced r mm. recently. And I, I was... 50 then I was I was looking for another adventure if I'm yeah. honest but I didn't fancy Geneva but I went for the interview they yeah. offered me the job and I went around the place stayed overnight and I said this is overpriced it's not me I don't like the vibe yeah. the it's just not for me it's a wonderful place it's not for me yeah and uh, they said well we're opening up in Hong Kong soon okay so I came here at my own expense stayed here for a week and fell in love with it immediately yeah. Because uh, my friends who work in Dubai, Singapore, in the same industry, they often boast when we meet up here in Hong Kong, they say, oh, Dubai is very clean and sterile and modern and Singapore yeah. is futuristic and this, that and the other. I said, you're right. But I said, Hong Kong has a pulse. Yes. You've got buildings here with bamboo scaffolding outside them. Yeah. And gigantic, modern, fantastic buildings next to all, next to all structures. Yes. And it works. Somehow it works. Yeah. And you've got all these islands around the place. You've got authentic Hong Kong. Yeah. You don't see a lot of that in Dubai. You don't see a lot of authentic Arab lifestyle. No. Same in Singapore now. It's really moved on, which is a good thing. And they're great places. But Hong Kong has a pulse. Yeah. And until yeah. recently, it was 24 hours. Yeah. So I came here and uh, I joined that same company from Geneva, who, uh, who have since moved to Australia. I didn't want to go to Australia. Yeah. So um, I've worked here with a few different companies. Yeah. And now with uh, St. James's Place, so I'm really enjoying because it's a it's a much easier brand. A lot of my work comes from lawyers and accountants. And yes. 
St James's Place are a FTSE 100 company. That's comforting. Yeah. They uh, they guarantee the advice. Yeah. Which is very comforting for people. And they are a great stable of products and services. So I, I think you're a client, don't you? I am, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Since you came to Hong Kong, have you always lived in Lantau? Yeah, when I first came here, I moved into um, Central. And I lived in Sain Pung for Good a couple day. of years. And um, I came here by accident. Didn't like it at first. Uh, it was a, It seemed at the time a little old and rustic for me. And I was used to this. I was becoming a city slicker, which is unusual. Yeah. But then... And I went to some of the places, I met some of the locals. I thought, hmm, I could like it, yeah. And when I finally moved in, I loved it. I mean, now I've got some great friends. Um, it's definitely a community. Yes. And um, in my next book, I talk about my brothers and sisters from all over the world that live here. Yeah. My Mexican sister, Nepalese family, right. you know, uh, everything from African to Australian, they're all your Americans. Yeah. Even the Americans. Even, <laughs> even, I know, even the Americans. Yeah, yeah so a bit of a, a, a melting pot. You moved into Moiwo how many years ago? Five. Five years ago, yeah. yeah. Five years And um, so you commute backwards and forwards? Not so oh. much. Um, since COVID, yeah. Um, I think one of the things you asked earlier was how has it affected us? Yeah. And I think COVID. Um, on the positive side, I've learned a lot of new skills. Yeah. I've learned to work remotely. Yeah. With like capture for signatures, Zoom, Microsoft yeah. Teams, all of those things sprang up very quickly. And um, now it's possible to do my process from start to finish, which is quite onerous remotely. Yeah. I don't need to see clients. However, in Hong Kong, wealthier clients will want to see me. So I only go in now maybe twice a yeah. week maximum. Okay. And, and and a lot of clients don't want to see me. I mean, I'll tell you a funny little story. When I first started Zoom, and bearing in mind, Hong Kong is very transient. People are in and out all the time. Yeah. Pilots, bankers, financial guys, in and out all the time. Teachers even. And um, it was it's so difficult. We, we call it in the office the Hong Kong dance. You can't pin people down. Yeah. Which is very hard for me. Yes. To make an appointment, then you don't see them for six weeks. Then they come back and things are at a date. It's very difficult. But with Zoom... That problem went away. Yeah. Now, I'm talking to people now on Zoom, and my competition is a two-year-old boy that says, Daddy, can we play Star Wars? And it's, uh, it's, it's great, because yeah. I know I, I have them there, and, and I've got really good quality time. I do, though, like to meet them before they sign up. Yeah. I like to see the color of their eyes, shake their hand, discuss the service. Yeah. And we usually do that over a, a glass of wine or a coffee in Central, Yeah. depending on the, the time, because most people go in once or twice a week. Yeah. But yeah, COVID is definitely done. The other thing I've noticed post-COVID is how clean everything is. The oceans. Yes. There's yeah. far less litter. Everything seems a bit more pristine. Yeah. And and I haven't met anybody since COVID that's had a cold or flu. Yeah, that's your background. And then I wanted to move on to the reason you and I met, really, I guess. Um, we have mutual friends. You popped in the shop one day and said... Hi Gary, have you heard of my book? You offered me a copy, which I've then started to read, and I'm avidly reading it every night. I'm sort of two thirds of the way through, and finding it very energising and you know full of great advice. So, what made you write that book? Okay, I had no intention of writing a book. Okay, and now I'm kicking myself because I could have wrote a book thirty years ago. Yeah, and I recommend anybody if you think you can. There's a story in everybody. Yeah, but porridge with honey is not a story. Uh, a few years back, I was diagnosed with cancer, and it focuses your thinking and puts a sense of urgency on everything. And the craziest th thing is, since then, I've had my most successful years. I've had my biggest clients, and I wrote the book, which I'm proud of. So yes. the book was not written initially to sell. Okay. I paid Partridge Publishing to produce 14 copies of a book, which was my legacy to my granddaughters. Because I, I want to live forever in yeah. their minds. And leaving the money is not going to do that. But leaving a book with, uh, I mean, they've, they're beautiful girls. They photographs on the front. Yeah. Um, How many grandchildren? Three. And what are their names? Well, Skylar's six. Okay. Chanel, four. Right. And Tiana's two. Okay. So uh, this year for Christmas, I'm buying my son a TV. So, <laughs> but uh, no. It, and where do they live? Dubai. The grand Dubai. They're all in Dubai. Yeah, but the... the the essence behind the book was 
I've been inspired by great people throughout my life. Fantastic yeah. people who have taught me, helped me, uh, from Aristotle to Buddha to modern religious leaders to, and I'm not religious, Tony Robbins, Einstein, you know, uh, Newton. And it's been fantastic advice. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to share good advice to my granddaughters at different yeah. periods in their life. Like, uh, what do you do when you really feel bad in the head? You know, yeah. you feel down or dark, and there's a section, chapter called Monster Me. Yeah. to deal with the mental monsters. And that's not all my work, that's things that I've learned. Yes. So I just want to leave them with um, lots of advice from the greats, with my spin on it, and, um, you know, and tell them a little bit about my upbringing, which is only at one chapter. Yeah. And the dedication. Yeah. And then the rest is about, let's let's go for it. And yeah. And I, I look, at, look at it now, it's quite funny, there was one thing that, helped me with the book as you know I'm writing my second book yes and that's going to be nothing like but I'm laughing writing the second book <laughs> but there's one thing in the first book which stalled its production and there's a section in there where I say I talk about focus yes and I say if you chase two rabbits they'll both get away uh, I was having battles with my publishers because I was chasing two rabbits without realizing it okay. every time some idea would come in my head for the second book I'd yeah. write it down and it takes me off focus. I read the chapter on focus. Yeah. And that day I said, I do nothing else on the second book. Yeah. Nothing, because I want to finish this within a few months. Yeah. I finished it within two weeks. Really? And still worked. So the whole book from inception to to actually getting it printed, what was the time period? I made a meal of it. I made yeah. a meal, but I was also... Well, you say you made a meal I was of it, but it sounded like you did it amazingly quick. No, no, it was spread over about four years. Well, four dipped years. in, it's dipped out. And, and there was periods during there where I was sick, but I couldn't work for a month or two. Yeah. And uh, as you know. Uh, but, um, and, of course, I was very busy. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it was a part-time project. And uh, it was that little quote that, that got me yeah. got me to finish it. I, I said it wasn't meant to sell, but the publishers think it could sell. They, they think it would appeal to grandmothers, yes. to mothers, to girls to teenagers to yes. people into personal development yeah and it's uh, what's been really humbling is the comments i've had back about the book i've not come from grandmother's mothers they from yeah. i had a wonderful comment from a guy uh from one of my son's friends i've never met him he bought the book yeah. i don't know the guy yeah he bought the book and he just said Marty he said this this has really given me the kick up the butt i needed to get me focused and wow. i looked at this guy's background on social media he's a very successful guy I had a lovely text this morning off a chap you know, yeah. Peter Price. Oh, yes. And he said, this was not what I was expecting. Yeah. And he said, well then, he said, it's, you know, it was a really positive message. Yes. And that was nice from Peter because Peter's well-traveled. He's a stately gentleman. Yes, he, yes. Very direct talker. Very down to earth. If he didn't like yeah. that book, he'd tell me. Oh, you'd know about it, absolutely. And, uh, so yeah, I was, I was pleased. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, that's done now. And, my sons are very good at marketing and they want to market it, but we've sold a few hundred copies already just from Facebook. As the book is sort of addressed to my granddaughters, um, it's not a story, but it's addressed to them. But in the, in, in the introduction, I actually say, use it as a dip book. Dip in and out when you want to. Yeah. My youngest son is running an education company yeah. for Barberin, and he was doing a session last week and he sent me a, par yeah. a chapter from my book, a photograph. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, uh, your section on goal setting, yeah. he said, um, I'm using today. And I said, oh, which part? And he said, uh, fall in love with your obstacles. And I yeah. said, why did you choose that? And he said, well, dad, you've always taught us that you set your goal yeah. and then you look at what's in the way, all the obstacles. Then you plan a strategy to remove the obstacles yeah. and you got your goal. If the yeah. obstacles are not there, there's nothing in your way. And I said, oh, I'm really proud you're using that. And yeah. uh, my eldest boy has marketed it very well. Yeah, and um, he read it. I, th I think he found it emotional because it's his daughters, and he's produced three, you know, wonderful daughters. They're yeah, great, they're great fun. They look so cute on if the they cover. They were you and now you'd love them. Yeah, I bet. I can them. absolutely yeah. see that in their faces. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned earlier second book. So what's going to be in the second mm -hmm. book? I never saw myself as an author. This was like a legacy. Yeah. But as we were going through it, the the one lady she's gone now, she was interviewing me and I didn't see it, about my life and what was going on. And and she said, your life's been turbulent. You know, you sort of had it all, yeah. lost it all, got it back and lost it again. 
And I said, well, that's why I can give such good advice in the first book. <laughs> yeah. And she said, there's a story there. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm not sure. And I'd started this. And then one day, um, I spent nine months in France three years ago, south of France. And one day I'm in a bar with big Joe Kelly. And Joe's a big Irish man. And I won't swear. Yeah. But we were both licking our wounds. To, to be fair, we'd both been conned a bit. Yeah. And I was coming back to Hong Kong. And he was, I never give up my home year, my job year, nothing. But it was a nice exotic project yeah. we, we went for. Didn't work out. And Joe and I were in the bar discussing our future, what we're going to do. And he told me a lot about his life. And then when we got into, um, like, you know, growing up in Merthyr, the highs and the lows, the, the, the divorce was particularly hard for me. And a lot of changes in my life. Mm. Um, we've both been screwed in business. That happens. Yeah. And, uh, and then he got into the bit on cancer. And I, I beat it once. I tamed it second time. And then it came back. Mm. And then he said to me, he gave me a quote, which I'll never forget. He says, Martin, there's, uh, he said, go through all that, he says, there's only one reason you're still alive. And yeah. I can't do the Belfast accent. No. <laughs> so I said, oh, why is that, Joe? He says, because the devil can handle the competition. <laughs> and I told this to Anne, the publisher, <laughs> and she said, stop. Yeah. And I said, no, I'll tell you what else. He no, no, stop. That's the title of your book. The devil can handle the competition. Like it. And uh, I said, are you That's sure? That's a great title. Said, that is are you sure? For a song and a book. <laughs> well, she said she was sure, and she they basically talked me into doing a, an autobiography, which I, I didn't think I'd be interested enough to write about. But when she said, she said, look, the conventions you've been on with your company and the stories you've told me, people want to read about that. Living in three different countries, people want to read about that. Yes. And she said, I'm American. She said, most Americans don't have a passport. They don't leave. And she said, honestly, she said, your little stories sound nothing to you because it's your life. But there is a market for it, she said. And, and I said, OK. Well, then I started writing it and introducing some of the characters I've met. Yeah. And I thought, this is making me laugh. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm trying, I mean, I think you know for, for charity, I do a little bit of stand-up comedy. I've done it a few places. Tap Tap, White Stag. OK. Hong Kong Brewers. Oh, uh, right. But it's always for one of my favourite charities here. Yeah. But, um, you know, putting the humour into it, like... Um, give me a quick example you know um, Jack Martin yes right, now Jack Martin is a character there's no doubt about it absolutely right? Th there's the guy's history he d there's a book there yes but I introduce his character by saying uh, we call him Moose he's Canadian okay uh, I say Moose he had an attitude only a mother could love and a face you would never tire of punching <laughs> now, yeah that's Jack actually any, anybody Good else you say that about would probably give you a thump yeah he, he loved it yeah I bet make me famous make <laughs> me famous and you uh, will as well I so think I'm gonna try and include yeah um, I'm also a bit cheeky so there's 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 a few stories I'm gonna put in some are true some are not but whether right. whether they're not I'm just gonna put in brackets maybe true yeah mark yeah, yeah. And that was the other thing the publisher wanted. She said, uh, bring the humour in. Yes. Make it fun. Work on the drama. She said, you've had some low points. Yeah. Very low points. And uh, how did you deal with the illness? People want to read about that. Yeah. And that, that chapter got bigger and bigger. And I thought, there is things, because people are terrified of that illness. I mean, yeah. I know you've come through it. Yeah. And um, and I did before. But I, I it doesn't, I can't be frightened of it. Because it is what it is. We've got to deal with it. Yeah. But people, she said, people will want to read about what it felt like, how you dealt with it, what treatments you took. Yes. Um, how did other people react? Yeah. And I said, I, I just never thought of that. But I said, I wouldn't talk about it. And she said, write about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's been some amazing times. I've met some great people uh, on conventions. I've yeah. been on the speaker circuit and met some wonderful speakers who I've mostly supported, I've been the supporting speaker, but yeah. it's been, I've learned from them. Yes. And there's there's yeah. a great humility, I think, in around successful people who, who want to share. And, yeah. um, it, it, you know, it's like a, a confidence mixed with humility, but a, a genuine love of the game. And that's how I feel about my industry and my life. Yes, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's been good. So the second book will, should be out in a couple of months. Right. I've got a big boring exam to do. For the SFC soon. Oh dear. So I, can't, I, can't, I can't chase two rabbits. I have to make a decision this week. Yeah, you've got to follow your own advice there. Yeah. What I'm going to focus on first, finish the book, or get this exam under my belt. Mm. I know Tough I, one. I, I know what I'm going to enjoy more. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, so, yeah, it's uh, that's how that came out. Yeah. And, and looking back now over some of the characters, like there's one guy I grew up, not grew up with, but knew very well, 
Uh, he's passed now, but it's a guy, Ken Robbins. Oh, he was hilarious. The things he got up to, but I won't go into that or I'll be talking for hours. <laughs> he was just hilarious. Yeah. And uh, and that was the way it was, you know, going to a local bar in business. And um, I've been very lucky. Very yes. Lucky. I think you bring your own luck to a certain extent, don't you? And I think also right time, right place or whatever. But a lot of it comes from you and you don't realise, I think, you know, yeah. you're you're a genuinely happy, bouncy, funny guy, I think, you know, yeah. um, but but I can see that you, you know, you, you've got a, the serious side of you is when you need to get down and do the finance stuff. You yeah. do it, and you do it very, very well. Sure. Yeah. Um, so um, I look enjoyable. forward to it. That's enjoyable. Yeah. You know, looking after people's money is really enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, I I do a lot of events in Hong Kong, or did prior. Go. We will start again soon. Yeah. And we have a brand here with people you know. Yeah. I don't know if you're aware of the brand. It's called uh, Health, Wealth, and Wellbeing. Okay. All and, right. And uh, I usually get four of us to speak. I yeah. MC it, and we get a doctor up first. Yeah. And we've had some local doctors, Paul Murray, okay. Susan Jameson. Right. So they will talk about they a bit and then explain why we may live to be beyond 100. Yeah. And then I speak as the killjoy and say, <laughs> but that's great, but what if you run out of money when you're 70? Yeah. And then we get Jill Marshall up in her leotard, yeah. right. who's an expert in yoga and Pilates, and she will talk about posture, relaxation techniques, and busy executives okay. need this. Natalie uh, yeah. is a relationship coach. Okay. And in a very classy way, she'd be talking about sex, but it had to be classy yeah. or I, I wouldn't put my name to it. But <laughs> she would talk about why relationships go stale, what you could do, yeah. the zones of the body. And that event yeah. drew bigger audiences for me than anything I've done in my career. Because I think if I just talk to them about money, it can be boring. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. Money's a heavy subject. I try to put humour in, but you can't get too humorous with people's money. Yeah. And tax is boring and things like that. But yeah. when you've got four people speaking about the most important parts of your life, health, yeah. wealth and well-being. And I started this in South France. Okay, that's back a good here, balance. And yeah. it's been good. And I've done a few other events. We have, um, during the summer now, our company's got access to the Yacht Club. Okay. So I have my own brand called Bubbles and Banter. Okay. While I invite some clients in, no business, yeah. not looking for business. Yeah. Just a thank you to bring them okay. in. I did, did a good interview recently with um, Kevin Reed. He's okay. a top MMA fighter. Right. And he came to one of my sessions and said, yeah. I want to talk. I said, well, what would you talk yeah. about? And he said, well, I'm a coach. I'm a personal trainer. I said, they two yeah. a penny in Hong Kong. Yeah. And he said, well, I want to join. And he's Welsh. Yeah. yeah. And Kev had a great story. Yeah. Um, he, he got in a lot of trouble. Did yeah. a little bit of prison. Yeah. Come to Hong Kong like Bruce Lee as a street fighter on the roofs. Oh, wow. And a wealthy Chinese guy saw him and yeah. said, uh, you don't need to be doing this. But he was making money. Yeah. Kev now is part of a big gym in Hong Kong. And uh, when I said, what would you talk about? He said, I don't know, help me. So I said, <laughs> what's the difference between a personal trainer yeah. or an MMA coach who's doing personal training? Yes. I lost him for 20 minutes. There you go. And he brought everything yeah. out, you know, the, the the physical aspects, the confidence, the self-defense. I said, that's yeah. your talk. Yeah, 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 brilliant. Yeah. And then he signed himself into a retreat on Lantau for two weeks. Right. For meditation. Okay. And he was coming out the day before the seminar. Yeah. And there was no booze, no cigarettes, no meat, total focus, no phones. Yeah. For two weeks. Yeah. And when he came out... He was so relaxed, he made Perry Como look a nervous wreck. <laughs> I thought he was going to burst into a coma. Yeah. And I saw him the day before, and he said, I can't do it. And we had 20 people come into Jimmy's Kitchen for a breakfast seminar. Right. And I said, Kev, you've got to do it. Do you know how hard it is to get 20 people to a seminar in Hong Kong? Yeah. And yeah. He, I, he said, I can't. I haven't had time. And I said, you've got a great story. He said, I haven't had time to prepare. And he said, and I've just come back, and i got 10 appointments today. I said, right. okay, come tomorrow morning. I'll interview you. Yeah. And that's what we did. Oh, okay, in front of the everybody. And I think half the audience wanted to meet him. We got yeah. a bit of business out of it as well. I spoke first and then him. Yeah. But he did a great job. Are there any plans to do another comedy night at the Deerhorn or, or anywhere else, really? This all started, right, mm. with uh, Tim Cronin, John Morgan, the policeman, yeah. me and a few others, sat outside having a drink yeah. five years ago, okay. telling jokes... Three of us are Welsh anyway. Yeah, Telling I know stories, John well. 
ribbing each other. Yeah. Now, John tells good stories. Yeah, he does. I and love he embellishes John. them a bit, yeah. but he's a great storyteller. And uh, we were there, ribbing each other, making yeah. each other laugh. And, I, and somebody said, why don't we get up there and do it? And a few weeks later, it was Nate's birthday. Okay. And they stitched me up. <laughs> we were all going to do it, and it ended up being me. So I begged, borrowed, and stole some jokes. And whatever. Yeah. And Nate's an easy target. He's old and he's American. Yeah, yeah, that's and it. He's one of my best buddies. Yeah. And uh, it went really well. Yeah. And uh, to follow me, we had two local guys, Malky. Mm. Right. Uh, who's about my age, but his voice is getting better. He's a brilliant singer. Okay. And uh, Ed Lightning Fingers on the guitar. Okay. So they put the music on. And we had a lot yeah. of people there and, it, and they stayed late. And then I met this charity. Are you familiar with um, Jeff Rottmeyer? I'm not. Impact no. Hong Kong and the Love 21 Foundation. Okay, no. Well, at the no. time, Impact Hong Kong is a big charity in Hong Kong and they help yeah. the homeless, mostly local people. Okay. But Love 21 mm -hmm. Foundation is a fantastic idea. They they help children with, uh, who are either like mentally handicapped, learning difficulties. Right. Children who go into a classroom and they're not confident with okay. people their own age. But he develops them through sport. And, you know, he's got a nine-year-old girl with Down syndrome who can surf. And n none of the kids in the class can. Brilliant. So when she goes into the classroom, her tail's up and she feels a bit better. Yeah, That good. must have an impact on her learning. Yeah. And when I met Jeff, I took him into my company that has a huge charitable foundation. Mm. My, com my company agreed to um, support the charity. Yeah. So if I raised any money, they would match it. Oh. Match funding. And uh, the first one I did for him was at the White Stag in Wan Chai. Okay, yeah, no, it well. Com comedy quiz night. Yeah. And Michelle said, uh, the owner, whatever goes in the bar, food or drink, 10% is going to this charity. We okay. raised a lot of money that night. And then I did a few Brilliant. more at the Water Buffalo. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if the Tap Tap one was for charity. Paul Wellham's a good friend of mine. We had a special night yeah. that night. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it went. It went well. I mean, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not a comedian. This is just a sideline. for Yeah, a bit of it's just something. But you asked, is there another one coming up? Yes. And there is because um, it's Jack's big birthday this year. He's seventy. Nate and Jack have birthdays okay. coming up. So I'm hoping we can combine it and do a double act. Yeah. And uh, and that they don't chicken out this time. Oh my god! I, got, I can totally abuse them, and I can't <laughs> wait. And do you know what? Either yeah. can they. They yeah, love yeah. being abused. They yeah. love the attention. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I mean, Jack's quite a strong character Nate's a bit yeah. placid guy yes. I've got to do, we've got to do a joint one yeah yeah definitely we've got to do a joint. I think that, I think that would go down really well in terms of how to contact you sure. they can certainly buy your book here yeah um, and um, the title is Porridge with Honey and it's dedicated to my granddaughters who are Skylar, called... Chanel and Tiana yeah available on Amazon and if anybody wants to contact me I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn, Martin okay. with a Y Ludlow. Yep. And um, uh, one of my friends Googled yesterday, Martin Ludlow Porridge with Annie, and, and there's a load of, I, mean, I can't believe it, it's, it's right really? at the top. Yeah, right at the top. Martin with, so there's about, Excellent. I think I saw three or four pages of different booksellers. Yeah. Telephone number is uh, 68715864. Okay. And my private email is... Uh, Martin with a Y, Martin Ludlow at hotmail.com. No numbers, no, no, yeah, split, they've just Martin Ludlow at hotmail.com. Okay, and one last thing actually that um, I'm reminded of you offered a, a wonderful thing, I thought. So, in this shop, we give away books, we give away books to help us. We particularly like to support people who don't have the means um, necessarily and need, need some support. You offered me um, a PDF of your book. And you said to me, I can pass it to any of the helpers sure. in Hong Kong that yeah. you felt it would benefit from it. Well, you inspired that. When I read, before I met you, that um, for, for, for the listeners, the domestic helpers in Hong Kong are primarily um, Filipino, Indonesian people. They work and long Thai. hours. Yeah. And Thai, yeah. yeah. They work very long hours and they get one day off a week and they don't earn much money. And you have been giving them ac giving them access to free books. Yeah, yeah. They can come in, take the book, yeah. and whatever. And I thought that was wonderful, and uh, and I know it's taken up. So it was your idea that inspired it. But yeah, if, good. If people can't afford the book, and want a copy, yeah, then they can come to you. Yeah. And uh, send them an electronic version free. I think that's brilliant. 
Uh, so if any of you uh, employers out there, because I don't know how many of the helpers will listen to this, if you have helpers and that um, you know want this book um, on a PDF format, and um, you just let me know. Uh, or Martin, no, sure. and we'll yeah. ensure that it goes to the right place. Yeah, but there's three versions now. We've got the hardback. I, f I think it's about thirty something US dollars. Okay. There's um, the softback, which I think we're selling you for just 150 Hong Kong. Yes. And Kindle, you can order through Amazon, which I believe is 3.99 US. Okay. Good. Three dollars ninety nine. Money well spent. Absolutely. Yeah. The whole premise for this book. Is Martin wanting to leave a legacy for his three granddaughters? And I think, you know, I'm surprised this isn't hasn't been thought about uh, across the board. I think it's a, such a, a noble, brilliant thing to do. Uh, and those three lucky girls, wow, you know, they're going to live with this legacy. Can I close with a very quick story? Yes. And it's a personal one. Um, when I wrote the book, the girls didn't know. Mm. and the publishers have put a, I think they've done a lovely job with the front cover they have I'm not very creative when it comes to that so I sent the book signed mm. to my granddaughters because I can't visit them so ah, okay. I DHL'd them to Dubai and uh, they all call me they don't call me granddad because when Skylar was born she couldn't say it right so they call me Gandad Honky Conky the books arrived Daniel yeah. knew he was expecting the DHL parcel so he got the yeah. girls together and he sent me the video of the oh. girls opening it oh. and the, the baby Tiana didn't know what to make of it oh. but the other two they were going yeah. going up to the waiter saying this is off my granddad Onky Conky that's me that's me <laughs> oh. and they were so pleased of the book and now Daniel says they, they're showing people is they a book now yeah it's, it's not mine it's they a book <laughs> they show this is my book and my granddad Onky Conky did this <laughs> oh how lovely but is what that? was really nice Brilliant. was Shara my daughter-in-law has been reading them the book at night Ah. And some of it's too old for them. This yeah. for me. But she's reading like the introduction. And Skylar and Chanel are now asking, well, who was granddad's granddad? And there's a bit in there about my sister. Yes. And she said, was Uncle Martin and uh, granddad Onky Conky and Auntie Tweez ever young like us? <laughs> <laughs> and of course the answer the is innocence. no, they weren't. No, no, it's the innocence. <laughs> but I mean, my oh. son and daughter-in-law, I think, will keep the legacy going because yes. they've been you know, courteous enough to, to read the book to them. Yeah. But what's been lovely is it's prompting questions from them, which I didn't expect. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wish my ex-wife now, and I, I'd like to help her, probably yeah. not with a book, but maybe an interview about her family yes. so that my granddaughters can read about grandparents on the other side. Yeah. And uh, j just bits about the characters, personalities, because they come from great stock. Shara's parents are successful people. You know, and yeah. my ex-wife's come from a great family, and uh, that's their blood. Yeah, and yeah. they should they should know more about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they always used to say that as I was growing up. You know, you you should always talk to your grandparents because they won't always be there, and and what they've lived through. You know, our grandparents they've lived through two world wars and absolutely. You know, some yeah. very tough times, yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, they've come through them. And how did they get through them? And yeah, it's important to get those stories out there and, and let them yeah. live forever. Yeah, And I could never um, underestimate the influence my grandparents had on my life. And yeah. They weren't academic, but they were great rules, great values, great, yeah. great stories. I was sat in the China Bear one night with Simon McCarthy, a okay. well-known well local author, and, I know and he's wrote a brilliant book. Yes, I mean, that is The a, Bond. He, he inspired also. He, he wrote the foreword for my book. Yes, I saw, I read and that. And he was asking questions because he knows Merthyr Tidwell. Simon's uh -huh. an action man. He's done hang gliding, mountain climbing. Yeah. They used to hang glide off the cliffs in Merthyr. You, you'd never get me up in one of those kites. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it's uh, crazy. but Simon said, when I read the, in, uh, the dedication, he said, yeah. I could smell the coal. I know Merthyr. I love Merthyr. Wow. And he said, tell me just quickly a little bit about um, your mum. So yeah. I said, well, during the day, she was the police cook. And right. in the evening, she worked in the local takeaway chippy, the Golden okay. Kitchen. Yeah. So the guys would be fighting every night in Merthyr. In the evening, she'd be um, patching them up, bandages. <laughs> and then the next morning, she'd be cooking their breakfast in the police cells. <laughs> so one night, I'm in, the, That's brilliant, I'm, in, I'm in the Vulcan with a pretty girl from Bedlinog. I think I'm about 18. Yeah. And her name was Julie. Yeah. And there was a bunch of guys from Bedlinog who liked her. 
and I thought I'm in trouble now and they were giving me the look and beckoning I thought oh I don't want this I'm not a fighter I'm a lover yeah yeah and with that one of the hardest men in Merthyr came over and stared at me and I thought oh, I'm in deep trouble now <laughs> yeah. and he said to me are you Pat's boy I said yes and he just looked at these guys and there was eight of them and they ran <laughs> and I went to the, he said it's okay don't need time if you're Pat's boy fine I thought I went home to my mum and I said I'm glad you're my mum <laughs> oh wow and she, wow. she walked with a little tail up listening to Gene Pitney and Tommy Steele how but, cool uh, is that but Simon said are you Pat's boy he said that's a chapter oh that's good I like and, it and uh, and I said yeah because my mum very humble lady yeah not academic at all yeah low paid jobs so yeah I was uh, she's featured more in the next book because my grandparents were the first okay so that just remains for me to say martin ludlow thank you very much for coming and talking to me at vibe thank you gary and i really appreciate your help you can listen to all our podcasts published at soundcloud under gaz or on youtube under live at vibe hk or follow the links from my website at vibehk.com finally a reminder that vibe is open seven days a week every day of the year from 12 noon until approximately 6 30 p.m well that's it for another week Thanks for listening to the 22nd Vibe Book and Music Shop podcast called Vibrations. I'm Gary Brightman. You get my vibe? Can you imagine what this old island must have looked like to those Dutch sailors when they first saw it? Fresh green. Like a dream of a new world. They must have held their breath. Afraid it would disappear before they could touch it.